All right. So I'm going to be preaching on Jesus Christ going to hell for our sins uh, this morning. Uh, I thought we'd cover this topic again. It was requested by somebody. So let's go through the verses and let's uh, talk about this topic. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, we learn about the gospel, right? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So, you know, whenever you're wondering where the Gospel is, this is one of our memory verses too. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. It's good to know. This is where the Bible clearly defines what the gospel is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we are saved by when we believe it. Now, we understand the importance of the resurrection. That very chapter itself talks about the resurrection. It says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So we know that the resurrection is critical to our salvation because, you know, Christ didn't only have to, you know, die, bury, and rise again, but he had to do it according to the scriptures, right? So, you know, the way in which he did it was also important too. Now, the burial is also an important fulfillment of the scriptures, right? So sometimes we just sort of brush over the burial and we just say, obviously he died, he was buried, he rose again. But did you know that it was critical that Jesus Christ was buried? Because if Jesus Christ was not buried, he did not die, was buried, and rose again according to the Scriptures. Now, this is a passage that I've shown many times, but as a reminder, this is Deuteronomy 21, 22. Look at what it says. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be, and he be put to death, and look at this, and thou hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. What does it mean in any wise? It means in every instance. Bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So in the Mosaic law, it was said, well, if somebody is cursed of God and they've, they're hanged on a tree, you can't hang them all, all night. They have to come off the tree, right? So Jesus actually coming off before the Sabbath day and being buried is actually fulfillment of this scripture that the land would not be defiled, right? So there's some spiritual application there, even though it's a law in Old Testament Israel. So you can see here in Galatians 3.13 that Christ was a curse of God for us. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And I believe that is quoting Deuteronomy 21 when it says, he that is hanged is accursed of God. So Jesus is actually fulfilling this scripture by being accursed of God, right? Hanged on a tree, but then needing to be buried so the land would not remain defiled, so that the sin would be put away, right? So the burial is also an important fulfillment of the scriptures. Now, today we're talking about Jesus Christ in hell because I want you to understand the extent of Christ's death. Now, some people are shocked when they learn this doctrine, right? They have some objections to this doctrine. They'll, like, I've heard many people tell me when I talk to them about Jesus Christ being in hell, they'll say, like, oh, it's, it's blasphemy that, um, it's blasphemy that Christ could go to hell. How could you say that? And, my thought is, you know, you sound like a Muslim when you say that because this is what Muslims say. They'll say, like, it's blasphemy. How can God be born of a virgin and come out, you know, born like a man? Well, you know, is it blasphemy that Jesus Christ is a, 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 is a curse, made a curse for us? Is that blasphemy? Is it blasphemy that God was, like the Muslims think, born of a virgin and walked among us? Is it blasphemy that Christ takes on flesh walks among us? Is it blasphemy that God can hunger, thirst, 
and die for our sins? I mean, is it blasphemy that when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life? I mean, is it blasphemy that Christ is represented by a brazen serpent being lifted up? Well, it's because he's taking on our sins. I mean, is that blasphemy? So, the way I see it is, if it's blasphemy that Christ goes to hell for us, I believe that's denying the extent of God's love for us, that he would enter his creation, that he would give his life a ransom for many. And what does that mean? Is that just his physical life? No, it's also the fact that his soul went to hell and suffered the eternal wrath of God in our place. So another objection people say is, well, Christ did everything required for our salvation when he died on the cross and said, it is finished. They say like, no, 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 Jesus, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Everything that needed to be done was done for our salvation. John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. There it is. Jesus did everything that was needed to be done for us to be saved. There was nothing more that needed to be done. The suffering and the death, it is finished. Well, what, about, what about the burial? Didn't his body need to be buried? And then the, otherwise the land would be defiled? What about the resurrection? You know, the resurrection, it says, if, if there be no resurrection from the dead, our faith is vain. Yeah, yet in your sins. So the resurrection is important as well. What about his role as a priest after the order of Melchizedek, entering in to the real holy place, sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat, his blood testifying on our behalf? That had not been done either. So, no, when it, he said here, it is finished, it's just the fact that he died. You know, and I don't have the verse from James in here, but it says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. This is what he's referring to, the fact that his earthly life He's, he's dying for our, physically, right? In terms of his soul, is now leaving his body. So, for me, when I heard Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins, it, it didn't shock me at all. I mean, for me, when I first heard of it, it, it made complete sense to me. Because Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we know that that death that that's talking about is not just a physical death. This is what I explain to people at Solomon. I say, that's not just a physical death, because a physical death is when your soul leaves your body. Now, if that's what Jesus is saving us from, then why do we still all experience the physical death? We're obviously not saved from it, because we all experience a physical death when our soul leaves our body, and our body is dead on the ground. So what death is happening that he actually saves us from this death. It's the death of the soul that is being saved, right? So if he is our sacrifice, if he is our substitute, and he is dying in our place, does it not make sense that if our soul dies, it goes to hell, that somehow he goes to hell to offset that payment, right? So if death refers to hell, how could Christ have died in our place, never having gone to hell? So Let's look at a few passages today from the Bible. And for those of you who are more familiar with this, you know, this would be a good reminder. For those of you who aren't so familiar with it, I want to show you today from the Bible that this belief is not only logical, right, but it's also biblical. So let's first of all look at the preaching of the Apostle Peter. The preaching of the Apostle Peter. Peter's preaching. Now, Peter's preaching in Acts 2, he is quoting David. Now, there is a few psalms, right? There's not only the psalm that Peter expounded on the day of Pentecost when he talked about being in hell. There's a few psalms, actually. So there's Psalm 16, 8 to 10. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So that's the one that Peter preaches, and we'll look at that in a second in, Psalm, in, in Acts chapter 2. But that's the one that is quoted not only by Peter, but also by Paul when he preaches in Acts chapter 13, but he just doesn't make the direct application. He's talking more about the fact that Jesus rose again, but Peter actually talks about David as well. 
But look, here, this is Psalm 18, verse 4 to 5. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. So even though David is, because David did not go to hell, right? David is just referring to the, the anguish that he's going through and likening it to hell. But what we realize in Acts chapter 2 is David is actually prophetically speaking from the point of Jesus Christ, actually suffering in hell for us. Psalm 86, 13, For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So is that David talking? No, that's not David talking. And this is, how do we know this? Right? We don't just have to guess that this is prophetical of Jesus Christ. This is what Peter actually preaches on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him, Jesus Christ. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I shall not be moved. So this is Psalm 16. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. So he's just quoting Psalm 16 right now. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So it's a different, slightly different wording there of Psalm 16 when it talks about by, thy, by your side there's pleasures forevermore. Verse 29. So now he explains what that psalm means. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. So he's saying... This psalm is referring to Christ. It's not referring to David. Why? Because David died and his body did see corruption. He died. He didn't rise again from the dead, like it's saying in Psalm 16. Therefore, being a prophet, so that's how we know David was speaking prophetically as Jesus Christ in Psalm 16. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So you remember David misunderstood that. He thought he was referring to Solomon, but you know, he was actually talking about Jesus Christ. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his, whose soul? Christ's soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now, I think this is the strongest passage, passage about Jesus Christ going to hell because it just plainly states it. Right? It takes the Psalm 16 and says, My soul, his soul was not left in hell. And then Peter preaching it says, Hey, you know what? That wasn't talking about David. That was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, but he rose again and his body did not see corruption. Right? So his body was not even in the grave long enough to rot. Right? Three, three days and three nights. So that's the first one. Peter's preaching. Second point to show that Jesus Christ suffered in hell for our sins as part of, you know, the fulfillment of Scripture that he needed to, to save us. Number two is the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah. Now, in Matthew 12, it says here in verse 38, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So the scribes and the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, Hey, we want to we see a miracle. Show us something. Which... He did so many miracles and they didn't believe as well. So I don't know why they're asking for a sign. So in this instance, he doesn't give them a sign. He says, He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus says to them, a sign that's going to be to the scribes and the Pharisees is the fact that Jesus Christ will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now, the heart of the earth is not six feet under when he was buried. The heart of the earth, obviously, you know, is right in the middle of it, right in the middle of the heart of something. But what's interesting here is even though in Matthew 12 he says he's going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, it's when you compare this to Jonah chapter 2 and see what Jonah actually preached and prophesied of 
he actually mentions hell. Jonah 2 verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy heaven thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. So you see how this all ties in to Jesus' soul going to hell and suffering for our sins. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Look at this. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. So you see how even though Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights. He's prophesying out of the belly of hell, cried I. He's saying the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So you see how the same way Jesus Christ suffered an eternity, an eternity of hell for us, being an eternal being, but in three days and three nights, according to the scriptures, he rose again from the dead. And Jonah is referring to this too. So we see this descending into the lower parts of the earth, also in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? So after he descended, right, he ascended up to heaven. Right? We, saw, we saw, you know, when the apostles spoke to him, and Jesus Christ went up into heaven. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first? See, so before he ascended up to heaven, before he resurrected, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So that is the second point, right? That the, you have the sign of Jonah. So you have Jonah is a sign, three days and three nights in the whale's belly, even so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We go to Jonah. Jonah says, out of the belly of hell, cried I. He says, the earth with the bars were about me forever. We have Ephesians 4 saying, hey, before he ascended up on high, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Now, we read this morning from Psalm chapter 88. And the reason why this sort of ties into this sign of Jonah is because you see many of the very similar wording in Psalm 88 uh, as we see in, in, in the Jonah chapter 2. So I believe Psalm chapter 88 is a psalm where David is referring to his suffering, but it's actually prophetical as well of the suffering that Christ experienced when he went to hell for us. And as you read some of these things, you'll, and with that in mind, you'll start to see it now. Psalm 88, 4, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. So you see how even though David is, is a man after God's own heart, he's a saved person, but he's saying, I'm counted as them that go into the pit, right? The counted as them that go to hell. Why? Because Jesus Christ was made a curse for us. Jesus Christ went to hell for us. So he's counted with them that go down into the pit, even though he himself does not, will not go there. Um, does not deserve to go there uh, in terms of Jesus Christ. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. He's, Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. So isn't that the same as Jonah, right? He's in, he's in the depths of the earth, but earth with her bars about me forever. Thy wrath lieth hard on me, and afflicted me with all thy waves. You know, even Jonah talks about the water compassed him about. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of, of affliction. See, doesn't that sound like Jonah chapter 2? Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Verse 14. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou face from me? I am afflicted, ready to die from my youth up, while I suffer thy terrors. I am distracted. See, thy terrors, where do you think that's talking about? Suffering the terrors of God. 
Like, like we talked about last week, I think it was. It, it was it last week, the week before that, when we talked about the valleys. Like knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. So we see there the sign of Jonah. Jonah, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus Christ, uh, three days and three nights in the, in the whale's belly. Jesus Christ, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Number three. Number three point to show Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins is Jesus Christ is our Passover. Jesus Christ, our Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, this is where we get Christ, our Passover from. Verse 6, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So this is talking about the church being like a lump of bread, right? And not wanting sin in the church, like leaven, that leavens the whole lump. And there's certain sins that he talks about, 1 Corinthians 5. But he says here, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. So he's, he's, he's using the analogy of the church being like a, a lump of dough as leaven, and then you want to get the leaven out of this dough because otherwise it's going to spread throughout all the, all the dough because he's saying, hey, there's certain leaven in the church that needs to be cast out. So the bread, the unleavened bread of the Passover in the New Testament represents the church, like we should be an unleavened bread. And then who is the Passover lamb? Well, it's Jesus Christ. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See, when we take communion, we're going to take communion today, we are not continuing the Passover. Right? So this is why we don't, when people say, well, we practice communion like Passover, some people have the mindset that it's like, well, then communion should be done in homes, amongst families, like the Passover was done. No, because the communion is not a continuation of the Passover. The communion was a new ordinance, right, given by the Lord Jesus Christ when he had the Last Supper with the disciples. He's saying, this is something new that you do in remembrance of me, right? The Passover was a feast that they kept at a certain time of the year, but you can see here, how are we to keep this feast? It's not like, therefore, let us keep the feast by breaking of bread and drinking of the cup and saying, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. How do we keep the feast that no longer is being kept physically? How do we keep it spiritually? It's about getting the leaven out of the church. This is how we keep that feast. We have Christ, our Passover, which is honoured, in the church and then the church is the unleavened bread so this is why we keep this feast by keeping the church pure from the sins mentioned in first corinthians 5. so christ our passover we don't continue to keep the passover breaking of bread is not a continuation of the passover now when we look back at exodus 12 so now we know jesus christ is our passover we go back to exodus 12 to see, well, how did they keep this feast in Exodus chapter 12? And what does that possibly teach us about the Lord Jesus Christ? Exodus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So this is why some people who believe communion is a continuation of the Lord's Supper, they try and practice it this way because they're saying, well, we should practice it the same way that the Passover was practiced in terms of houses getting together in the house and it's too much lamb and you get together with your neighbour. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So Jesus Christ fulfilled a lot of these things. And you think about when they laid down the, the Psalms, it was you know, 10 days before he was uh, crucified, um, or 10 days into that month where he came and it was presented and shown that he was blameless. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, 
So here, here's what I'm trying to point out here with the Passover. How did they prepare this Passover? Look, and they shall eat the flesh in that night. Look at this. Roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. So he's saying you can't, don't eat the Passover raw, don't eat it boiled, roast with fire his legs, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain unto the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Now, what does that represent? You know, does burning the Passover with fire, does that just represent being beaten and whipped and hung on a cross? I think the logical thing there, just to think, is if it's burnt with fire, it's because it represents the fires of hell. His soul going into hell, burning for our sins, rising again, right? And I think this is why the Passover specifically says, don't eat it raw, don't boil it, burn it with fire. And if there's anything left over, burn it all, right? Because it is a burnt offering, just like every other burnt offering. You have the morning and evening sacrifice. You have all these burnt offerings throughout the Bible. My point number four is that's what Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the burnt offering. You know, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. You have the Passover lamb burnt, but you have all throughout the Old Testament burnt offerings being done. What does the burnt offering represent? It represents Jesus Christ, right? Being the sacrifice for our sins. You know, being that offering and being burnt. Let's start at Isaiah 53 when we talk about Christ being a burnt offering. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So there's a very famous passage, Isaiah 53, talking about the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now that part of the passage is very famous. Everyone knows Isaiah 53, the suffering, the stripes, the bruising, the chastisement of our peace being upon him, laid on him in the iniquity of us all. But it doesn't end there in Isaiah 53. That's what I'm saying. Like When you understand Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins, you're now understanding the extent of the suffering and the death that he experienced for us to save us. It wasn't just the physical suffering and the physical death. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked." And with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So you see how it's, it's in Isaiah 53 even, it's going past just the physical death. Now it's saying, oh, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Look at this. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. You see that there? The soul being an offering for sin. The Passover was burnt. And we see here Jesus Christ being an offering for sin. He was a burnt offering for sin in hell. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You see how that? Why is it satisfied? Because when Jesus Christ went to hell, what is he paying for? Right? See, when he shed his blood, he redeems us from bondage. 
And when he goes to hell, he's suffering the wrath of God. The wrath of God on sin is being satisfied. That's why Caesar Travail is all, shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, a burnt offering. A burnt offering. Ephesians 5. Look at this verse in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. So we know Jesus Christ. We talk about his substitutionary death. He died for our sins. He sacrificed his life for us. And this is saying he's an offering and a sacrifice in the literal sense, right? An offering, offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. This is a reference to the burnt offerings in the Old Testament, right? Here's an example of one. It's Exodus 29, 18. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savour, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So you see here in Exodus 29 and many other chapters where you can look at the sweet savour. And, and, and it's funny because when you, when you burn meat, it is sweet smelling savour, right? So you can imagine. You think burnt offerings is ashes and stuff. You know, that place would have smelled really good. It smelled like a, like a, like a meat house, you know, in, uh, in, the, in the tabernacle in the temple. So that's the sweet savour. Right? You know, when you cook a, you know, maybe I'm just hungry right now. But you know, when you, you know, when you cook, you ever cook like a, like a fresh, like steak, and you put it on that grill, and, and it, you can actually smell that it's sweet. There's like this sweetness that comes off it. So it's a sweet savor. So if Jesus Christ is an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor, I mean, how is it a sweet, sweet smelling savor? There's no burning going on, there's no fire involved. Right? It's because. He is. He's, he's, he's a sweet savour and offering made by fire unto the Lord. This is one I thought about as well. That, that this is obvious too. Genesis 22. When Abraham asked Isaac to offer his son, what sort of offering is the offering that he's telling him to offer his son? And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, look at this, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, is it just, you know, you could say, well, it's just because every offering is a burnt offering, but then that's my point. Every offering is a burnt offering. But even when he was told to sacrifice his son Isaac, it was his son Isaac to be a burnt offering. Now, Isaac with Abraham is, is the very picture of God sacrificing his son and rising again from the dead. So there's that picture there that Jesus Christ is the burnt offering. Now this is the last one. This is the last point. I'm going through the points and as I go through them I think the points get weaker and weaker but they're still all very good points to show the, 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 that this doctrine is biblical. Chapter 5. Oh, not chapter, uh, point number 5. The gates of hell. The gates of hell. Now, I think this, and I, I've said this a lot over the years in this church, but saying this again, I think this verse in Matthew chapter 16 is, is very misunderstood by most Christians. Matthew 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So what is he being revealed? The fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 18, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this verse is obviously misunderstood by Catholics because they think Peter is the rock, and they think Jesus Christ is building his church on Peter, which is absolutely foolish because why would Jesus build his church on a fallible man and not only that, a man that later on in the chapter he calls Satan. So it's like, well, are you building your church on somebody that can at some times be influenced or be even Satan? You know, get thee behind me, Satan. So it makes no sense at all. So the rock, obviously, is always the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon this rock, 
The rock is the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the rock that the church is being built on. Now, where Christians misunderstand this verse, they think when it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, they see this verse as like the battle between the forces of good and evil. Right? And yes, we are in this spiritual fight and there are spiritual forces going on. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Right? But that's not what this is talking about. But this is how they interpret it. They see it as the gates of hell shall not prevail against it because they see it as this battle where the church of God is like storming the gates of hell, you know, like some Lord of the Rings movie. You, know, you storm the gates and you're the battering ram and it's like we're, we're going to storm this castle that hell is in and take over. But it doesn't even make sense, right? Because hell is not where... Satan is like ruling and reigning and there's all these minions in there that the church of God needs to go and fight against. Remember, hell is the prison of God where people suffer and are tormented, right? It's a place where God rules and reigns. It's where God is king of and it's where people go where God has sent them, right? So it doesn't make sense that the church would soldier or in, like, you know, just uh, charge into hell. Right? Because we're not charging into a place of punishment. We will never, never taste the flames of hell. So I think this, the right interpretation of Matthew chapter 16, is actually a reference to Jesus Christ going to hell. So what is it referring to? It says, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is the it that the gates of hell will not prevail against? Is it Peter? No. Is it the church? No, I don't think it's the church. It won't prevail against the rock. It won't prevail against the Son of God. Right? Because what a, why does hell have gates? Why does a prison have gates? It's not to stop people from coming in. It's to stop people from coming out. Right? Because the gates of hell keep people bound in hell forever. Right? Until they are let out and cast into the lake of fire. Right, where hell is actually relocated. So they actually put back into hell, but hell is now in the lake of fire. So what this is saying is, Jesus Christ went to hell, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, meaning the gates of hell will not be able to keep Jesus Christ contained within. And in Acts 2.24, Peter alludes to this, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. So I believe that is the right interpretation of Matthew chapter 16, and it's another reference to Jesus Christ going to hell for us. So in conclusion, hopefully you can see there now that, you know, I don't think, you know, I, I found it very odd that people were shocked at this doctrine, but I think they're shocked at it because they're learning something somewhere else as opposed to learning it just from the Bible. Because when I first learned this doctrine, to me, from an ap apologetical point of view, it made complete sense because people will ask the question, you know, well, if Je Jesus Christ didn't go to hell. Like, if we deserve hell, how does Jesus just physically suffering and dying pay for an eternity of hell? Because if he didn't even go there, first of all. So one is, he did go there. And, and the thing is, like, even suffering and dying is not even more than, like, people have done in the past. Like, a lot of martyrs have, have suffered and then been killed. Now, what was special about Jesus Christ suffering death is he did it according to the scriptures. So he had to be crucified. He had to do it on the third day. You know, all, these, all the timelines of fulfilling. That's what's important about the whole physical aspect of it because it's fulfilling scripture. But in terms of the gravity of suffering and then dying, I mean, others have gone through, you know, maybe even worse because what about people that suffer and are tortured for like months and months on end for the name of Jesus Christ? I mean, Jesus Christ didn't do that. But you know what they don't do? Is they don't suffer God's eternal wrath in hell. Now the reason why Jesus can suffer an eternal wrath of hell because he's an infinite being. right? So we would need to go there forever. Jesus Christ can suffer it because he's an infinite being, can suffer that eternal wrath of God. But why did he rise again three days later? He could have done it in a day. He could have done it in a month because he rose again according to the scriptures. 
Remember, the sign of the prophet Jonas, three days and three nights. So the three days and three nights is significant because it's, it's fulfilling scripture. But the fact that he went there, he was able to pay the eternal hell for us because he himself is eternal. So this doctrine is clear in scripture and I think it helps us to understand how we are saved from hell. You know, Christ being eternal and infinite is able to satisfy an eternal punishment of God's wrath. But I think as well, you know, when you consider this too, it really gives us a greater appreciation of the love of Christ and the love Christ has for you. And if you consider that, you know, that may spur you on to live for him. So I'll just end on 1 Peter, 1 John 3.16. And I like how John 3.16 kind of lines up with 1 John 3.16 because you've got John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And look at 1 John 3.16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. So we're saying here, this is how we understand God's love because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So you see how your perception or comprehension or understanding of the love of God is tied to your comprehension and understanding of what he actually went through for you. And I feel as though if you don't believe he went to hell, you are not fully comprehending the extent of God's love for you when it says here, he laid down his life for us. And because of that, hopefully your heart is moved. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us. Not only dying for us and going through the suffering that, Lord, you suffered an eternity of hell in our place. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your love, that your love did not only extend to the death, but it extended all the way into hell, rising again, living for us, testifying for us. Thank you, Lord, for your love. May we show the same love that you showed to others and uh, help us, Lord. We need, we need your grace. We need uh, strength to do that. So I pray, Lord, that you know, your word today would move the people here, that it would move their hearts, that they would appreciate and understand and comprehend what you did for them. And Lord, may they live for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.